Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest analytical cannabis webinar, the analytical landscape of cannabis testing, potency testing. I'm Jack Rod, Editorial Director for Analytical Cannabis, and I'm here to moderate today's event. I'm really pleased to have Sean Orlovitz joining us today as your presenter. Sean has been working in the field of analytical chemistry for over 18 years. After receiving his degree in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Chicago, he started his career in large-scale synthesis using HPLC and GC techniques in reaction monitoring and purification. Sean joined Phenomenex in 2003, working on site with clients worldwide on method development, troubleshooting and method transfer. Later, he managed Phenomenex's new applications laboratory, where he drove innovation in chromatographic method development for many market segments. In his current role, Sean works on driving new solutions and support for the cannabis testing market and leads many efforts to improve analytical solutions for this dynamic industry. Following the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session and would welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions using the Q&A system to the side of the video player. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, please contact us using the chat system. And with that, I would now like to hand over to Sean. Thank you, Jack. And I, I first want to thank Jack and the entire team at Analytical Cannabis for sponsoring this event. And secondly, I want to thank you for attending. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the analytical land landscape of cannabis testing. Um, but I really want to accomplish something a little bit different today. My goal today is to get as many of you interested and engaged in one or more of these topics. I truly hope to recruit you into the community of science working on the forefront of potency because I want to help and we need your help. So as mentioned, my name is Sean Orlowitz. I'm the Business Development Manager for Food and Cannabis. And I'm really just very fortunate today. I am presenting on the first of many sessions sponsored by Analytical Cannabis in partnership with some friends of mine at SciEx and Joel on some really interesting topics. So before I get started, I just wanna promote that this is session one, but in February, March, and April, we have additional sessions covering pesticides in both GC and LCMS MS. And we're going to wrap up on 420 with residual solvents, which should be a great topic. Uh, again, with my friends over at SciEx and Joel, I think we're going to bring some great information, some great discussions about these very hot topics in the market. But going backwards, why are we here today? Well, unless you've been spending this two years of pandemic in a cave, or maybe you're a very fortunate person who just doesn't read the news, uh, the testing market for cannabinoids is a very dynamic place. And it's evolving and maturing in very interesting ways. Um, chances are you've heard a little bit about Delta-8 THC over the last couple of years, as many publications have highlighted the challenges associated with this evolving market. In addition to just Delta-8, also there's a lot of unique cannabinoids that are coming out. And it's really changing the marketplace and it's changing the laboratory and how we test for quote unquote potency, what analytes we look at. And at the same time, it's changing the dynamic range we're looking at, the types of matrices. And so really this entire topic, uh, this entire conversation is just gonna be about how potency has evolved, where we are today, and some of the things that we can do about it. So I like to call it what's new in 2022, the potency edition. And so just, there's so many things to talk about. Today, we're just gonna focus on these three things as I believe they're gonna be trends in 2022. Um, one being sample prep, one being potency by LCMS, and of course, THC isomers as they continue to evolve. I also want to kind of set the stage. A lot of what we're going to talk about today are just things that we learned in 2021, sharing with you some new topics. Uh, you may agree, you may disagree. And again, in the, uh, in the air of collaboration, I want to hear about it. And so uh, uh, as follow-up, please in the chat or follow-up by email afterwards, I want to hear how you feel about these topics what you found to be solutions in your laboratory, and by all means, agree or disagree with me as you will. So just to get started, let's talk about sample preparation. Uh, sample preparation specifically for potency, we've learned a lot. There's not a lot to it, I'll admit, but I want to bring up something that I learned in late 2021 that maybe gets you thinking, and that, you know, the traditional techniques of preparing samples for potency is first we mill or homogenize the sample depending on what it is. Uh, I think many of us in the market have learned a lot about homogenizing and milling, uh, what products to use, what products not to use, how high plastic products tend to give low cannabinoid uh, recoveries, things of that nature. Uh, we're not going to get into that today because, uh, frankly, I'm a chromatographer, but I'm certain we can give an entire presentation about milling. 
Um, but again, traditionally we mill the sample. We then do some sort of solvent extraction for potency. It's usually alcohol based. Uh, from there, we do either a syringe filtration or some sort of solid phase extraction pass through technique uh, just to remove some of the fats, the lipids, the precipitates that tend to come out in many of these matrices. And then we do the dilution. This is the uh, workflow that I have used for many years and I'm sure many of you use today. But one of the things that I learned in 2021 that I wanna share with you is the concept of volume loss. So whether you use a syringe filter or a solid phase extraction tube, there is an opportunity for volume loss in the media that you use. Granted, less with the syringe filter than say a solid phase, solid phase extraction tube, but it's still there. And so normally we don't necessarily uh, care about this, but what concerned me is that a lot of people out there are using the dilution equation, C1V1 equals C2V2, to calculate the concentration of cannabinoids in their sample. And in doing such, they're estimating their initial volume based on what went into, say, the syringe filter. So if I put 2.0 milliliters into the syringe filter, I just assume I get 2.0 milliliters out of the syringe filter. Well, what if that's not true? And so we've seen a couple of cases in which it's not, in which we have some loss of volume based on uh, just the dead volume of the media that you use. And if we were to overestimate the volume that we recover, we would then overestimate the concentration of cannabinoids in our sample. Never really thought about this before, but what it brought up is maybe a new workflow that I'd like to introduce to this team. So what if we essentially switch the dilution? So again, we go through the same first steps in which we mill the sample, we do a solvent extraction, again, same alcohol, but what if the next step we do is actually our dilution and preparation for analysis? The reason we do this is twofold. Number one is typically speaking, when we do our dilution, we're adding some volume of aqueous to our sample in order to meet initial mobile phase conditions in some cases. It's a good best practice. Well, by adding some aqueous to our sample, we are actually also creating an environment which further precipitation could happen. So there's an advantage in doing our dilution before filtration in that we want to filter a representative sample post dilution. Now, by using filter vials, I can actually then add a very known volume to a filter vial into, you can see the schematic on your right here, and then filter it in the HPLC vial. So then I have 100% confidence that the volume that I am using for my concentration calculation is 100% accurate as I'm doing the filtration in the vial, the entire volume stays there, and then I'm injecting directly from that. So, in this particular workflow, I just feel a little more confident in my concentration calculation. I just want to bring it to the team as is something that I learned late last year. Continuing on that percep perception change, here's something that I definitely come around on. I will fully admit that a couple of years ago, I would argue with my friends at SciX about using LCMSMS for potency analysis, as I believe, believed it was overkill. Um, I am a chromatographer, I will admit, I am not a mass spectrometrist, and so I just saw a very expensive detector. However, over the last year or so, I've really come around and I want to share that with the team, and this is why. Is that I'm not saying that LCMS MS is to use you know, for your workflow potency analysis for, say, flour and oil, but I'm saying that it has advantages and it could be an additional tool to be used in the lab that I've found very, very handy over the last couple of years. Number one, and most obviously, a triple quad mass spec has the sensitivity advantage over a UV detector. This could come in handy with minor cannabinoids, and we'll talk about this. Number two, and probably most impressive, is it has a specificity advantage. Uh, the ability to have MS-MS spectra, as well as specific MRM transitions for unique analytes, uh, is very advantageous. Another one as a chromatographer that I will again admit is a huge advantage is I don't necessarily need peak separation or resolution of all of my compounds if I use LCMSMS, uh, as we have a third dimension of separation there with the mass over charge ratio. And we'll talk about this a little bit. But more than anything, and something that we're gonna talk about a lot today is future proofing our methods, looking down the road and seeing what's coming. As more cannabinoids are being introduced, in UV, we're a little bit locked into when standards become available. And I will say the standards providers are doing a very good job. But with MSMS, we might not have to wait for a standard. We can take a look at the bigger picture of what's coming out in our samples. And in current 
uh, markets, I believe this is a huge advantage as uh, there's a lot of byproducts and unknowns, which we're going to get into soon enough. But just expanding, I want to share two examples of where LCMSMS is advantageous. Uh, the first is a case in which more sensitivity and selectivity is needed for essentially a broad range of compounds. And we're going to get into some of this. But we all have, after running potency for many years, we all understand that there are high abundance cannabinoids, you know, THC, THCA, CBD, et cetera. There are common but yet low abundance cannabinoids in CBG, CBN, CBC, et cetera. And then there are these trace analysis, these very minor cannabinoids that people are becoming more and more interested in um, uh, for, you know, for, because that's where the market's headed. Uh, uh, the second case we're going to look at is quantifying cannabinoids and limiting the number of injections uh, in a very, uh, what I believe is a, a tricky way, let's say. Uh, but on your right, just to maybe set the table, on the top is your typical LCUV spectra, uh, something I'm very familiar with. And uh, as you can see, we have good chromatographic separation, but you see it also takes a little bit of time. Um, on the bottom is a very common LCMS MS spectra. As you can see, we run a little bit faster. Uh, as we don't necessarily need the chromatographic separation. Uh, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more. So again, in our first case, here's just an example of which we're looking at a full spectrum product. Uh, as you can see on this top right, uh, full spectrum or broad spectrum products are becoming more and more popular in the industry, and therefore uh, more and more people are looking at them. Now, you know, a couple of years ago, we may have been more just interested in five to 10 cannabinoids of interest into quantity those, but we all know that there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot of publications that reference over 100 phytocannabinoids, and uh, we do not have standards for all of them for UV. And so the other common topic that's talked about in the industry is this entourage effect in which they, the clients or the, the users of these products want complex mixtures of both terpenes and cannabinoids uh, to have the best user experience. So just on the bottom here is an example of how complex these mixtures actually are. What this is, is an extracted ion chromatogram of a flower that we ran. And what we did is we looked at common daughter ions for cannabinoids and started to both chromatographically separate them as well as use uh, mass features to separate them. And by doing such, what we did is we identified over 112 features based on common daughter ions of cannabinoids in a single flower sample, 112 features. Again, compare this with our typical you know, 11 to 16 cannabinoid UV method. And you can see how powerful this could be uh, from, a, from a selectivity standpoint. Moving on and something that I thought is quite clever is using LCMS MS to limit the number of injections we run in the lab. We have all definitely prepared samples and injected a known volume of them onto an LCV UV method, UV method to find out that we just have to go back to that sample, re-dilute it, and re-inject it. It's a common practice in this industry. However, what if we used the power of mass spectrometry and the power of MRM transitions to limit those numbers of ejections? And so what you, can, what you see here is first, I don't need chromatographic separation here on the top in order to get uh, separation of my cannabinoids because as long as they do not share the same MRM transitions, I can use the power of the mass spec to separate them that way. So that's one advantage. Number two is that each analyte, as you can see here on the bottom right, has many possible MRN transitions to monitor. And some of them are more sensitive and some of them are less sensitive. And so what we can do is we can choose multiple MRN transitions for each analyte. And you can see here on the, uh, on the bottom left, here's a flow chart of the type of logic we could use. We could build a calibration range on the most sensitive MRN for that analyte. And if we should saturate our detector, uh, we can then go to a less sensitive MRM transition for calibration. And we can continue to find that logic until we find uh, or detune our mass spectrometer to find a transition in a DP and collision cell energy to fit within a known calibration curve that we've already ran. And I would like to point out that Science OS software has the capability to automate some of this logical decisions, which makes it really easy. Um, so again, rather than re-diluting and re-injecting, perhaps we use a less sensitive MRM or we use less sensitive condition in the mass spectrometer in order to find a calibration curve that works for us. This works very well for actually extending the linear dynamic range of an of a analysis, and it's very clever in my opinion. 
just demonstrating that with a particular analyte. Here's THCA, something we all look at every day, uh, under two different transitions. And as you can see, we have good linearity and good precision uh, under both of these MRMs. But look at the linear range here on the right between them. On the low end here on the top, we've got a linear range from 0.03% to 30% in the sample. And then again, in the same injection, just using a different transition, I've got a higher linear range from 3.6 to 90% with great precision accuracy. So this is a good example of, you know, we could use the same method for a flower in which we're looking, or a CBD flower in which we're looking at very low levels of THCA versus possibly a concentrate or something like that uh, in which the dilution scheme might be very different. Concentration, uh, concentrate might be an exaggeration there because we'd have to do a huge dilution, but I think you get the idea of using multiple transitions to increase the dynamic range of an of a, of a analysis, which is a neat trick. But... Now shifting gears a little bit to something that, uh, if you know me, is something that I'm quite passionate about and very interested in is uh, what maybe a mass spectrometer can't always do, which are isomers. So another reason I would argue the largest reason that we're here talking about modern advances in potency analysis is what's happening to uh, the, the pressure that's being put on the testing laboratories as a result of CBD conversions. Now there's a number of ways to do these conversions and this is just one mechanism that I've drawn out. And what you can see here is that by converting CBD into a, multi, into a THC product, you have the possibility of creating many isomers. These isomers often are isobaric, so they can't be separated by just mass spectrometry. We need chromatography, which is fantastic, but also they're very, very interesting. Another interesting aspect of this is that the manufacturers of these isomers are very convinced that they're making a very pure product. And as many of you who have run these compounds before, we can tell you that in most cases, there are byproducts. And in most cases, those byproducts are isomers. And so it's really changed the game in terms of what analytes we need to look at, how we approach potency analysis, how we consider the workflow from both sample admission all the way through analysis. And so I just wanna talk about that so much. But I wanted to show this slide because there's a lot of different nomenclatures out there talking about the different THC isomers. This is the one that I commonly use in terms of delta-8, delta-9 THC, delta-10, exo-THC, which is the double bond up there, and then delta-6. So going back to your, your most traditional high throughput method, which I would like to point out is typically acetonitrile based. Why is it acetonitrile based? Well, acetonitrile typically gives a very fast analysis. It also has a very low back pressure. And because of its solvent strength, it allows a lot of people to run isocratically, like in this particular example. The nice thing about acetonitrile based methods is that they can chromatographically resolve a few of the isomers. So in this particular method, we've got good chromatographic resolution of both exo-THC, delta-9 THC, and delta-8 THC. And that's the order of elution in which they come out in this case. But this is a standard at 25 milligrams per month. As everyone here attending knows, this is not what a sample looks like. And so we need to start thinking or maybe experiencing what happens when we actually run a sample. So in these high throughput methods, traditionally speaking, when we're looking at flour or oil, delta-9 was a giant peak, that one in the middle, Delta-8 might have been a minor that came out on a shoulder, and we could accurately quantitate it. And frankly, exo-THC is not something that we saw in natural products. However, now that we're getting these conversion products in our laboratories, we're starting to see different products in different elution orders. And one of the things that commonly happens with Delta-8 samples is their concentrates, or their very, very high percentage amounts. And so we might not necessarily do the proper dilution ratio or something like that, but it's very possible and common that when we run delta-8 samples, we tend to saturate our column. When we saturate an HPLC column, what happens is the peaks tend to be asymmetrically favoring the void volume. And what we call that is fronting, and it looks like this. So it's essentially the opposite of a shark fin or a tail that we're commonly seeing. One of the most interesting things that happens is when peaks front, like this example, they tend to absorb the peak that's in front of them, like this example. And so because of the elution order of your traditional high throughput method and the you know, huge resolution between delta-8 and delta-9, it's very possible that the high delta-8 THC chromatographic peak absorbs the delta-9. 
And unfortunately, because they're isomers of each other, UV spectra is not very helpful in this case because we wouldn't be able to differentiate them. I share this because I believe this is a possible cause for a lot of people seeing non-detect D9-THC in Delta-8 samples when other people will see it. Um, there are ways to improve it. We'll talk about it later. Another growing uh, topic is Delta-6 and Delta-10-THC. Again, these were not analytes that we were so concerned about a year or so ago, but in these conversion products, we're starting to see them. What's interesting to me about these products is not only are they isomers of each other, they're also diastereomers of each other. And as we'll see a little bit later, they start to bring in the topic of chirochromatography into potency analysis. We'll skip that for right now, but I just wanna talk about, we've been looking at these compounds for some time now. I find them very interesting. And I, this is a topic I wanna bring up to you to the market because I think we're a little unsure about how important these really are. So I wanna hear about that throughout this year. One interesting fact that I would like to point out is that chromatographically, these perform by reverse phase at least, very similar, except for this 6AR9R isomer. For some reason that I can't explain as a chromatographer for over 20 years, this particular compound seems to chromatographically resolve by reverse phase which I find fascinating, would love to hear if you're seeing the same, same things in your lab. So let me show you some examples of that. Sorry. So if we just try to fit these new isomers into our analysis, what we find is that they do come out late in the chromatogram, as you can see here, kind of in this THCA, CBCA region, and they do have some coalutions. Um, there's no one great method that I've found to rule them all, but I have found ways to incorporate these isomers into a traditional high throughput method without necessarily interfering with say D8 or D9. That's the really good news in this particular case. I also can tweak or sort of change in this particular case, my ratio of acetonitrile to or uh, modifier in order to move these compounds um, throughout the chromatogram. So in this particular case, there is still some coalutions, but if you'll notice, they're different coalutions than they were in the last method. Where I go with this is what I'm finding a lot of clients and what a lot of the market is using is maybe they've got essentially a second or third method for when they suspect they start to see THC isomers. And that's something that I'm starting to commonly see, and I think it's a great tool. But another direction that I think I've, uh, I've found to be a little bit easier, but again, has to be based on the needs of the market is methanol-based methods. And so in this particular case, what I've found is that almost across the board, methanol-based methods actually improve the resolution of D8 and D9 isomers across the board. Now, that is a very positive thing. However, I would point out that methanol-based methods have the uh, disadvantage of, because methanol is more viscous solvent, typically speaking, we have a higher bioback pressure. So, you know, you might have to run UPLC or some higher pressure capable instruments. The second thing is because methanol is a weaker organic solvent, we typically have to run a gradient. So the methods typically are a little longer. Now, they're not terribly long in this particular case, but they are a little bit longer than the acetonitrile high throughput based methods. But again, I just want to bring this as maybe a tool that you could use in your laboratory. If you're looking at a lot of Delta-8 samples all of a sudden and concerned about Delta-9, perhaps starting to run some methanol-based methods is a good idea to improve that resolution and get more accurate quantitation. Conversely, because this is chromatography and it's never easy, if I start adding other THC isomers into these methanol-based methods, I start incorporating more problems. Again, just kind of starting backwards in this particular case, you'll see that my D10 and D6 isomers, do, they do chromatic resolve in this particular method, which is fantastic. And again, three analytes co coalute, one of those isomers chromatographically resolves. But I've got a slight challenge here with XOTHC. Um, I will admit we know how to solve that problem if that's something you're experiencing. If you'll notice here with methanol-based methods, we typically use a very short chromatographic column, a 50 millimeter in this particular case. We do that because again, methanol is a more viscous solvent and it generates a lot of back pressure. And so we use a shorter column to limit that back pressure. Uh, if your back pressure is not a concern of yours and you have some very high-end instrumentation, you could use a longer column and you could probably resolve Delta-9 and XOTHC if that's something concerning yours. But again, it's just another example of how we use chromatographic parameters to find an analysis that fits our needs as an individual laboratory. 
Maybe you're not so concerned about XOTHC, so this particular method works out just fine for you. Again, just demonstrating that by adding delta-6 and delta-10 into a methanol-based method, I do get some chromatographic resolution from all the other cannabinoids, um, but I will admit that the other three of the delta-10 and delta-6 enantiomers do co-elute with each other. But again, in the, in the breath that I said mentioned earlier of collaboration in 2021 or 2022, I want to hear from you. Do we need to chromatographically resolve these, these enantiomers of delta 10, or are they fine coeluting because they tend to just be quantitated together? That's something the market's going to help me define. Most people, once we start talking about isomers and coelutions, will say, well, hey, maybe I could use the UV spectra to resolve these compounds. Uh, at the very top of this is this uh, 6AR, 9R, delta 10 enantiomer that does chromatographically resolve. But you can see it shares the almost exact same spectra as its enantiomer, as predicted. What I find a little bit interesting is that the diastereomers of these compounds actually have a slightly different UV uh, analysis. So again, going back to using a third parameter to separate our compounds other than retention time, perhaps the UV spectra could be used to differentiate between these enantiomers. Again, I look to you, tell me if this is useful or something that you can do in your lab, or maybe we just allow them to co elute Finally, something that I wanna talk about is chirality. So as I look to the future, as we start to talk about what, what does the later parts of this year, I strongly believe that chiral chromatography is gonna start entering into potency analysis, probably from a research level in the beginning. But for those of you who may be familiar with chirality, chirality is a, the function of a, a compound to essentially have a hand in this, a left hand and a right hand. And what some people don't necessarily realize is that cannabinoids are actually chiral. Um, the biological processes by which the plants create cannabinoids is an enantiomerically specific or chiral specific process. So most of the common cannabinoids that we work with every day are enantiomerically pure. They're one pure enantiomer. However, Number one, there are a couple cannabinoids that are produced racemates as racemates in the biological process, CBC being one of them. And number two, as we start to explore these semi-synthetic pathways that our clients are using, that enantiomerically specific synthesis is no longer present. And it's not only possible, but it's probable that in some of these conversions, we start converting, uh, we start producing enantiomerically non-specific analytes. So what I mean by that is, what if we were producing both the plus and the minus THC or, you know, some of these other, you know, Delta 10 is a great example. It has two chiral centers. And so I do believe that as we start to research these pathways, as we start to work closer with clients, that we're going to start to be interested in and look at the different enantiomers of cannabinoids. So I just want to provide an example of this uh, with the help of some friends down in Kinetochem. Thanks, Everett. I know you're here. Uh, we were able to get our hands on some the enantiomerically pure minus CBD as well as plus CBD, and we were able to separate that using chiral chromatography. Uh, again, for those less familiar, I'll point out that chiral chromatography is a different mode than reverse phase. So this is likely going to be something that we do uh, on a separate method on a separate column. But if it's something that interests you, I would implore you to reach out to us. It's something that interests us, something we're looking more into, and another trend in 2022 that we'll be focused on. Before I finish, I just want to give some acknowledgments. Uh, I'm representing work from a lot of people here. Uh, here at Phenomenex, we have a number of fellow scientists focused in on cannabinoid research in Zara Jalali and Zishan Akil. Thank you guys for your work. Um, Infinite Chemical analysis. Thank you, Josh, Dave, Susan, and Eric for your help and expertise in this. Uh, for the LCMS data at SciEx, thanks Matt and Carl for running that. Uh, Kate Evans from Longboard Scientific is always a great resource uh, for sample preparation as well as other topics. And then as I mentioned earlier, um, Everett, Chris, and Jeremy from Kinetochem were able to provide those uh, CBD enantiomers and work with us on the separation of it, which was a really fun project. Before I finish, again, uh, I want to promote that this is just the first in four sessions to so keep your eyes out for emails from analytical cannabis, um, as well as some of my colleagues from both SIAX and Joel about uh, the, the next sessions on both pesticides by GC and LCMS, as well as residual solvents uh, later on in the spring. And with that, I will finish. Uh, please 
This is, uh, again, I implore you to email me at seanofanomics.com with your thoughts and concerns on how you approach some of these topics. Did you find it interesting? We have a number of resources at phenomics.com on the landing page for cannabis. I want to thank Animal for Cannabis. I want to thank you guys for attending. And now we'll open it up for question and answer.